Uh, today is exactly one year since President Putin, at the request of President Assad, agreed to send our uh, Air Force to help fight terrorists in Syria. And from the very beginning, we proposed to the American-led coalition to start coordination uh, of these uh, operations uh, and to distinguish, uh, to separate actually, the opposition which was cooperating with the coalition led by the United States uh, from Nusra, ISIL and other terrorist groups. The Americans only were ready for deconfliction, as you know, uh, and it took them, I think, several months, a couple of months at least, uh, until in December uh, we created uh, International Syria Support Group where they pledged solemnly uh, to take as a priority uh, an obligation to separate uh, the opposition from Nusra. They still, uh, in spite of many repeated promises and commitments, they still are not able or are not willing to do this. And uh, we have more and more uh, reasons to believe that from the very beginning the plan was to spare Nusra uh, and uh, to keep it, uh, you know, just in case uh, for plan B or for stage two uh, when it would be time uh, to change the regime. I can uh, only recall, speaking of Aleppo, uh, that in August this year, the uh, opposition, where more than 50% were Nusra, as confirmed by the United Nations, uh, has taken the southern uh, western suburb of Aleppo, cutting off 1.5 million people and basically organizing siege uh, preventing them from getting uh, any supplies by the most uh, easy and available route. Uh, and there was no uh, noise, no hysterical statements. Uh, the Western people, as far as I understand, who run the show, they thought that this would be the uh, prelude to, uh, the, to, to Aleppo being taken by the opposition. Now the situation is different and we hear all these noises. People if, I may, get if, killed. if I may, I understand what you are saying, Foreign Minister, but I need to ask you about the situation on the ground. We have seen, seen it on video, the evidence of civilians being killed in their own basements, their bunkers, by your Russian-made bunker-busting bombs. The doctors have told us of the scale of the casualties. Why is Russia continuing with this bombardment when you know what you are doing to the civilian population? Well, uh, I am coming to it actually, I am get getting to it. We take all necessary precautions not to hit civilians. The uh, term collateral damage was invented not by us, uh, you know by whom. Uh, and we are taking, as I said, most uh, strict precautions to make sure that we don't hit uh, civilians by any chance. Uh, if this happens, uh, well, we are very sorry, but we need to investigate each and every accusation. So far we have not been given any uh, meaningful proof uh, of what is being uh, said about the convoy which was bombed uh, or attacked on the 19th of September and which we have good reasons to believe was a provocation. Well, and we, we, we would be the last one. If we, we, we can talk about the convoy in a minute, but if you want evidence of what your forces are doing on the ground in Aleppo, then I can provide some. We have seen one of your unexploded Betab bunker-busting bombs actually filmed on the ground in Aleppo. So we know you are deploying those weapons. We also have seen clear evidence of incendiary phosphorus munitions being used, which again come from Russia, cluster bombs as well. These are Russian munitions which violate the international laws of warfare. Well, we're not using uh, any um, munition which is prohibited by the United Nations, I can assure you. So about the situation in Aleppo, the entire problem derives from the fact that the United States and the coalition led by the United States cannot and refuses basically to separate the opposition uh, from Nusra and the uh, terrorist groups who joined Nusra. Instead of separation, we see more and more groups coming uh, into alliance with Nusra. And uh, whenever we hit Nusra, we are told, look, you shouldn't do this because there are good people next to it or in the middle of Nusra's position. Uh, then this is a vicious circle. We cannot fight terrorists unless we all agree that those who, who want to be part of the solution, part of the cessation of hostilities, get out from the positions occupied by them. 
This is as simple as that. But uh, from the beginning of the U.S. operation in Syria, they started by very reluctantly hitting ISIL, and they only went after ISIL uh, in real way after we started our operation. As for Nusra, they never touched Nusra anywhere in Syria. I raise this problem with John Kerry every time we, we talk, and we talk basically every day. And today would be another one, as far as I understand, a request from Washington. And he keeps promising that as soon as we stop flying, as soon as Assad stops flying, uh, they would start separating or start thinking about separation. By the way, we had many pauses, many humanitarian pauses uh, during this year, 48 hours, 72 hours at the request of the United Nations. Every time these pauses have been used by Nusra to get from abroad uh, more fighters, more munition and more weapons. So there must be some first step. There must be some first step and we have to get our priorities right. Humanitarian things are very important and we are doing everything now together with the Syrian government. We made sure they agreed to it to help the United Nations to get weekly pauses in Aleppo to deliver humanitarian goods. It's the Nusra-controlled uh, people in eastern Aleppo who refuse to do this until there is total quiet because they run short of the munition and weapons and they need resupply. You, that's you, that's you as minutes, simple minutes, as it is. Yeah, Minister Lavrov, you, you talk about your contacts with the Americans. You will know better than me that over the last 12 or so hours, the message from Washington has been simple. Unless you stop the bombing in Aleppo now, then the Americans say they will end all diplomatic contact with you, they'll end all talk of military coordination, and they will look, quote, at all other options. So are you prepared to end the bombing or not? Well, they also said that Russia would be losing airplanes, uh, soldiers, and Russian cities would be attacked. Uh, it was unacceptable threat, uh, and maybe this was, uh, you know, uh, a signal that those who want to do this can start. It's absolutely unacceptable and uh, deplorable, I would say. As for cooperation, there was never cooperation between the two military uh, of Russia and the United States, except for deconfliction. What we did have uh, was discussions uh, and uh, negotiations on documents uh, which we started issuing uh, on, uh, well, sometime in March, but which the Americans uh, did not want to make public. And every time they said, well, we'll make this public uh, uh, after we uh, negotiate another, another part of it. Then another part, then John Kerry came to Moscow in July, and we finalized a very good document by the way, the document started with pledge to separate the opposition, uh, the, the, the healthy opposition, so to say, moderates from Nusra. And it was never done. And they were always shy uh, to make these documents public. Eventually, when we finalized the package of five documents on the 9th of, Sept on 9th of September, uh, we decided that this was the time, you know, to start implementing them. And the D-Day -D 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 was... Uh, announced on 12th of September. The cessation of hostilities held for a couple of days. The Syrian government did start pulling back its forces from the Castello Road, and the opposition was supposed to do the same. They never did. Instead, they started firing at the Syrian uh, forces pulling back from Castello Road. The Syrian government, as provided by the Russian-American agreements, established its checkpoint on the Castello Road. The opposition was supposed to establish its own. They never did. And now the Castello Road cannot be used. Now Castello Road cannot be used because the opposition threatens to fire at any humanitarian convoy using Castello Road. Right. Let me stop you this there. Is, this is the fact. Let, let me stop you there. You've raised something very interesting. You did you, stop me there already. <laughs> yes, I did. And thank you for listening to these questions. You uh, say that the Americans struck at that uh, Syrian military post, and you are right, the evidence is clear, and the Americans have said it was a mistake, and they've apologized for the loss of life in that particular incident. They accuse you, as do many international observers, and indeed UN officials, of being responsible for the airstrike on a, an aid convoy. Now, you have never admitted you did it, despite the clear evidence that it did involve the Russian military. So now is your opportunity to apologize for that. 
Well, uh, if, as you say, there is clear evidence that this was the uh, job of the Russian military, I would like to see this evidence. Uh, I know that the United Nations, uh, in particular on our insistence, announced that they start an uh, in investigation and we would be very thoroughly watching how this investigation goes. I can tell you only one thing, uh, uh, and this is the fact known by the United Nations. When uh, the convoy was agreed, uh, the opposition uh, in control of Istan Aleppo told the United Nations that the convoy should not be launched because, they said, they had information the government would attack it. The United Nations, in spite of this serious warning, said it doesn't matter whether anybody plans to attack us or not, we are sending the convoy. Uh, and to understand what, is, uh, what might have happened, we have to go back to August 26, when there was another meeting between John Kerry and myself in Geneva. And on that very day, Stefan de Mistura said that humanitarian convoy was ready to leave from Turkey to eastern Aleppo via Castello Road. And uh, he said, why don't we announce it? It would be so symbolic uh, at, at the moment when Russia and the United States meet. Uh, on that very day, uh, before the convoy left, the Aleppo uh, opposition said that they would hit this convoy, that they would not allow this uh, to get into Aleppo via Castello Road. Then the United Nations basically blinked. Uh, they said, okay, maybe we'll talk to them, maybe we'll try to persuade them to change their mind. Uh, let's wait for a couple of days. We waited for a couple of days and we waited for two weeks. Uh, then it was mid-September. The opposition in control of Eastern Aleppo never allowed this convoy in. So now, when the 19th September convoy was about to be launched, the same opposition said that they had information that the government might attack it. Uh, don't, you, don't you think that this uh, looks uh, fishy? Well, I'll tell you what looks fishy, the fact and that your, for... your aerial surveillance drones were monitoring that convoy and you had two Russian Su-24 uh... warplanes in the air above it. But let us not spend too long discussing that incident. As you say, an investigation is ongoing. Let us look at the bigger picture. We've talked in this interview about your relationship with John Kerry and the Americans. Samantha Power, the U.S. Ambassador at the U.N., recently said what Russia is doing is is not counter-terrorism, it is barbarism. How toxic would you say relations between Washington and Moscow are today? Well, I think she is a bit uh, aggressive, uh, even for the representative of the United States. Uh, we believe it is absolutely unacceptable to use this language. Uh, we said what we think about this already. I don't want to come back to this, uh, and I don't want to discuss the manners of our American colleagues. Uh, I believe everyone uh, who is uh, um, aware of how they work uh, know about those manners. And I prefer, I prefer to concentrate on the facts, not on some hysterical statements when people lose control of events and, and of, the, of themselves. Do you think the Americans have lost control of both of themselves and events? Well, I think uh, that if they uh, do not present uh, any evidence to the contrary, they either uh, are driven by Nusra or they uh, tacitly support this terrorist organization. And I believe, you know, if you take the history, during Reagan administration, Al-Qaeda was born because the United States was supporting Mojahedin uh, movement in Afghanistan. Uh, against the Soviet Union. During uh, George Bush Jr., uh, ISIL was born after they invaded Iraq and after in May 2003 they dismantled any structure with Sunni uh, population, be it army, be it security, be it police. And I am afraid that uh, the, this particular administration of the United States uh, might make history uh, by uh, being the administration which uh, gave rise and support to Nusra. Mm. L l let me ask you a few quick-fire questions, and if you would, uh, Foreign Minister, quick-fire answers as well. Is all talk of, the, uh, of a cessation of hostilities, a meaningful ceasefire in Syria, over? Is that prospect at an end? No, it is not over. And uh, when we met in New York, uh, we said that uh, we are ready to implement the document which, which we agreed in full, provided this time we don't uh, get any uh, pretext to delay the separation. Let's sit down, let's have the map, 
uh, and led the American and Russian officers to exchange information and to clearly indicate on that map where Nusra is. Then everything can, can start uh, because we don't want to be cheated again and again. All right, uh, a bigger strategic thought now. In March of this year, President Putin announced that there was going to be a pullback of Russian forces from Syria, which would begin in the spring. Here we are at the end of September, one year into your military operations, and far from a pullback, you are being drawn ever more deeply into the Syria conflict. Your strategy hasn't worked, has it? No. Uh, I believe I believe that uh, you are uh, making it a bit a bit uh, wrong because what he did say that we would be partially withdrawing our air force from there, and he uh, made a caveat that if the situation requires, uh, we would always be able to build back the force in Syria. The the the, the bottom line is. It looks to many people, and this is what the Americans are saying, but others too, that you can't actually rein in President Assad, and that you, particularly in the foreign ministry in Moscow, are unhappy about some of the things that are happening, particularly in Aleppo, but actually Bashar al-Assad isn't listening to you. You know, my, my job uh, is not about being happy or unhappy. I can only give you facts, starting, from the first, uh, starting with the first document on Syria, Geneva communique of June 2012, uh, we made all necessary efforts to make sure that the government cooperates. They endorsed these documents a couple of days after it was adopted. The opposition never did, uh, and we, support, we pro proposed to have it endorsed on the Security Council. They refused, uh, and only one year and a couple of months later, the opposition reluctantly said that they are ready to accept this document, provided as it goes, which was not uh, a precondition contained in that paper. Then each and every time uh, Russia and the United States or International Syria Support Group produced uh, some decisions, the opposition was always saying that they are only going to cooperate if as it goes first. The latest uh, arrangements between us and the United States were rejected by the so-called High Negotiating Committee and its leader, Riyad Hijab, the former Syrian Prime Minister who defected in, in 2011, I think, uh, in summer. He uh, publicly stated in an, in, in an interview to Al Hayat, if I am not wrong, that uh, uh, he cannot, and this Er Riyad Committee, as it is called, cannot accept the statement that Nusra is a terrorist organization. He said Nusra uh, cut off all, all its links with Al-Qaeda and that Nusra, Nusra must be made a respectable participant of the political process. I asked John Kerry yesterday whether he accepts this. He said no. I said, why don't you say this publicly? And I'm still waiting. Right. Well, you, you've told me a great deal about your concerns about the Nusra Front uh, in all of its guises. I want to ask you a simple question. Bashar al-Assad says he will continue his military operations until he has recovered every inch of Syrian territory. Are you going to offer him full military support until he's recovered every inch of Syrian territory? You know, the cessation of hostilities never ever provided for seizing any activities about Nusra and ISIL. And this is what we are guided by. Yeah, but you haven't answered he was, my question. Of course, uh, very you much. haven't he answered was... my question. Do you yes. believe Assad can recover every inch of Syrian territory and will you be providing military support until he does so? <coughs> no, no. We believe, we believe that the Russian-American uh, deal must be put into effect. For this, the only thing which is necessary is to separate the opposition uh, from Nusra, if it is uh, supported by the United States, not on paper, but uh, in real life. And then we will insist on immediate cessation of hostilities. All right. We haven't Except much Nusra, time. of course. We haven't much time left. I want to address a couple of other issues. On sanctions. Because of your response to the downing of MH17, the recent prosecutor's report, which made it quite plain, all the evidence points to a Russian missile that was brought from Russia into eastern Ukraine, shooting down that Malaysian airliner, and then the missile launcher returning to Russia. Because of your response to that, it is quite plain that international sanctions on your country are not going to be lifted anytime soon. How is Russia going to continue to live with these sanctions? 
Well, we already explained what we think about this report uh, of the uh, Dutch, um, uh, whatever it is called, council. Uh, by the way, the investigation group, which was created in July 2014, uh, did not invite Malaysia until end of that year. Uh, it, was, it was very uh, strange, uh, and nobody explained to us why this was the case. Uh, another strange thing, in addition to what was said by our aviation authorities and by the uh, uh, producer of this uh, rocket launcher, uh, the Security Council adopted a resolution in July 2014, 14, which, among other things, requested regular reports to the Security Council about the course of this investigation. There was no single report to the Security Council, and I wonder why. Uh, as for the technical details and the evidence which you referred to, uh, the evidence is based on uh, video images and photo images from social networks and from uh, the evidence received from unnamed witnesses. And the report itself and the pre presenter of the report said that they need to continue investigation. We submitted huge material to them and we would be very much hopeful that they would look eventually into this material. So no, I, no, I no, remind you, are, you that it was, it was by any kind of apology. Any kind of apology for what? for the fact that the evidence points clearly to a Russian-made missile coming from Russia and going back to Russia being used to kill 298 people on board that plane. Well, first, even, even from the point of view of the logic of the investigating committee, the investigation is not over. They said that there are some hundred names, but none of them is a suspect, none of them is a witness even. Uh, so, even from this point of view, let's not jump to conclusions. But what I can tell you is that the um, information we amassed, uh, including the results of the tests conducted by the uh, producer of this uh, rocket launcher, was given to the investigators and Ukrainian data, American data, was never given and made public. Foreign Minister Lavrov, thank you for joining me. We you and this special BBC World News program at this point. Thank you. Used, which again come from Russia, cluster bombs as well. These are Russian munitions which violate the international laws of warfare. Well, we're not using uh, any um, munition which is prohibited by the United Nations, I can assure you. So about the situation in Aleppo, the entire problem derives from the fact that the United States and the coalition led by the United States cannot and refuses basically to separate the opposition uh, from Nusra and the uh, terrorist groups who joined Nusra. Instead of separation, we see more and more groups coming uh, into alliance with Nusra. And uh, whenever we hit Nusra, we are told, look, you shouldn't do this because there are good people next to it or in the middle of Nusra's position. Uh, then this is a vicious circle. We cannot fight terrorists unless we all agree that those who, who want to be part of the solution will, are not willing to do this. And uh, we have more and more uh, reasons to believe that from the very beginning the plan was to spare Nusra uh, and uh, to keep it, uh, you know, just in case uh, for plan B or for stage two uh, when it would be time uh, to change the regime. I can uh, only recall, speaking of Aleppo, uh, that in August this year, the uh, opposition, where more than 50% were Nusra, as confirmed by the United Nations, uh, has taken the southern uh, western suburb of Aleppo, cutting off 1.5 million people and basically organizing siege, uh, preventing them from getting uh, any supplies by the most uh, easy and available route. Uh, and there was no uh, noise, no hysterical statements. Uh, the Western people, as far as I understand, by whom? Uh, and we are taking, as I said, most uh, strict precautions to make sure that we don't hit uh, civilians by any chance. Uh, if this happens, uh, well, we are very sorry, but we need to investigate each and every accusation. So far, we have not been given any uh, meaningful proof uh, of what is being uh, said about the convoy which was bombed uh, or attacked on the 19th of September 
and which we have good reasons to believe was a provocation. Well, and we, we, we would be the last the, one. Uh, if we, we, would, we can talk about the convoy in a minute, but if you want evidence of what your forces are doing on the ground in Aleppo, then I can provide some. We have seen one of your unexploded Betab bunker-busting bombs actually filmed on the ground in Aleppo. So we know you are deploying those weapons. We also have seen clear evidence of incendiary phosphorus munitions being used who ran the show they thought that this would be the uh, prelude to, uh, the, to, to Aleppo being taken by the opposition. Now the situation is different and we hear all these noises. But, uh, if, I may, if, I, if I may, I understand what you are saying foreign minister but I need to ask you about the situation on the ground. We have seen, seen it on video, the evidence of civilians being killed in their own basements, their bunkers, by your Russian-made bunker-busting bombs. The doctors have told us of the scale of the casualties. Why is Russia continuing with this bombardment when you know what you are doing to the civilian population? Well, uh, I am coming to it, actually. I'm get getting to it. We take all necessary precautions not to hit civilians. The uh, term collateral damage was invented not by us. Uh, you know, uh, today is exactly one year since President Putin, at the request of President Assad, agreed to send our uh, Air Force to help fight terrorists in Syria. And from the very beginning, we proposed to the American-led coalition to start coordination uh, of these uh, operations uh, and to distinguish, uh, to separate, actually, the opposition which was cooperating with the coalition led by the United States uh, from Nusra, ISIL and other terrorist groups. The Americans only were ready for deconfliction, as you know, uh, and it took them, I think, several months, a couple of months at least, uh, until in December uh, we created an uh, international Syria support group where they pledged solemnly uh, to take as a priority uh, an obligation to separate uh, the opposition from Nusra. They still, in spite of many repeated promises and commitments, they still are not able